Okay. We're live. Hello, everyone. The title of tonight's episode is The Nature of the Self of Selves. And to be honest, the title was inspired out of a kind of, I had a certain viewpoint of mine be clarified. That means I, uh, what I say today I experienced an incredible level of emptiness I experienced a sort of conceptual emptiness where it's as if my imagination didn't have energy <laughs> and so this sort of emptiness was a um, very uh, eye-opening for me it was very profound because in some sense, I notice in the fluctuations of my life between chaos and order, there I am witnessing the grand show, how the nature of the self functions. You see, we have in some sense contained this creature, the Homo sapien, in verbs and nouns, in structures. We, 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 we fail to see the hidden languages we are born into, the hidden ways of behavior we're born into. For me, it's a, on some level, reality is an existential opportunity. It's as if something's here rather than nothing. On the other end, the value of this something does not seem to be uh, limited to its own perception. What that means is, for example, what's a good example I could say? Pretty much as human beings function in society, eventually the effects of their caused actions will meet. And as it meets, suddenly what somebody is doing will have a value for another. I'm not saying kind of like another man's trash is another man's treasure kind of mindset. I'm not saying it like that. I'm just saying that we are all like in this one sphere. We're all, on, we're all creatures on a rock, okay, in the middle of nowhere. Now, just like how we dressed, dressed uh, ourselves in clothing, we have dressed the experience of the world in language, in ideas, in images. The world has been cut up into pieces. A kind of inevitability of, of the actual notion of world peace can be considered because it's as if the systems are all far away. They are not... Um, I feel we have never been alive in just a purely chaotic world, and we have never been alive in just an ordered world. We just have not been able to define it. It's as if, like, they put us in the middle of... It's like you are in, uh, in the middle of a river trying to figure out what a river is. I find that um, just like how when I look at words on an empty page, 
when I read a book or something, I see the content, I see those symbols evoke meaning and images behind my eyes. When I read a book, I'm actually, my mind's kind of animating a movie out of my color through my memories and experiences or whatnot. And um, similarly, when I look at life, when I look to, it's like whether you look at a symbol or whether you look at a phenomena or an activity, an action, I find that the action is being given meaning to as well. So what that means is all content, all observable, all observable phenomena in reality it is as real as it is contained and it is contained all your ideas I, I have this firm notion that all the ideas of the human being or how the memory or the imagination of the being occurs has to do with in some sense um, it's as if all their ideology is orbiting around the sense of self you know it's like in the middle of the sight of existence we're all moments of sight fundamentally what I'm trying to get to ladies and gentlemen is that the nature of the self is this deep mystery and it's the unknown factor in any way knowledge has conceived or contained or held the moment right now my moment can be said to be found my attention is moving towards these words but what my attention is and what can be seen are two different things that means if you look at free will there's something cool about free will you know you can't put your free will on the table it is not a tangible thing it is an intention in space. That's what free will is. It is, it is a sort of, I, I have considered it to some degree, it is, a, it is how the body moves in the mind and the mind moves into the, in the unknown. Rabindranath has this quote, Rabindranath Tagore has this quote, this uh, Indian uh, genius polymath. <clears throat> he has this quote where he says, Faith is the bird that feels the sun on its wings while it is dark. Imagine a bird at like, you know, early in the morning while the sky is still dark it's flying in the air it is flying in a pitch black abyss of no meaning nothing there is no hope it is the darkest hour of the bird's existence and then it begins to feel that waves of warmth contact its wings It's kind of like the contrast in life is through emptiness and fullness. And just like how we see, like, for example, on a picture, there's more light. There's more exposure of light, you know, and um, less exposure of light. I, I find it to be something similar. That as if our, the human intelligence is activated in, a, in the light of an attention. Okay? And what I'm trying to say here...
Light is being the world in our eyes. Light is being instantaneously the world. We are creatures of light. And so the mind, this is... The inner dimensions eventually go towards emptiness, guys. This is uh, this is an idea where it's kind of heavy. I'm just throwing it out there, but it, it kind of relates. It's, it's another parallel. Sometimes when I speak about something, I notice a pattern that echoes in other kind of activities that have occurred on this planet. As if you look at behavior and you begin to see it has a motivation. You wonder what is the motivation of the behavior, and you see it's a vision. It tends to be a vision, especially the motivation of behavior in human beings. It tends to either be a vision, a growing vision, or a fixed program. That means if we had a robot and the robot was doing something, let's say we program a robot to every day, like Rick and Morty kind of did this thing, like they had, <laughs> they had this Rick make this robot that would pass the butter. Now, I want you to imagine not a robot like that, but imagine like a kind of human, humanoid lo looking robot. And its purpose every day is to water the lawn. Okay, water the lawn and water the plants. This creature, because it is programmed to do the same thing, it doesn't matter where you put it, it, it will eventually water the lawn. It's as if the program of its existence commands it to do so. It is the boundaries and the edges of its free will. Now, we are not robots that are programmed with kind of like coding language, okay? But, but I'm saying we are creatures that similar to language, similar to how there is like a, 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 pro, a programmer types in code, similarly, we have a sort of genetical code. As if the words in the sentences of man also become it's like just like we have words coming into one meaning, we have in some sense particle cells coming into meaning. It's a sort of separation of structures then unification of structures, then separation of structures, unification of structures. We are in this, this universal sector is kind of moving like an engine between chaos and order. Its generators are constantly generating chaos and order. This chaos and order eventually will become conscious. When it becomes conscious, it doesn't matter if it's programmed chaotically or orderly. What does that mean? That means it doesn't matter if the child on this planet is born in the worst place, the most violent, savage neighborhood, or it is born in the most posh and elegant and kind of safe neighborhood. It doesn't matter if you're the son of a king or a beggar. It doesn't matter if you are a king or a beggar. It doesn't matter what you think because thoughts come and go like the leaves of the tree and the leaves of the tree do not define the tree. They are the effect of the tree. Your thoughts do not define you. They are a result of you. What you is, <coughs> is the attributeless presence of existence as attention, as if the light in your eyes is simultaneously being free will, as if the instantaneity of the waking state of consciousness, the moment the person opens their eyes, they are a person, ta-da, it's instantaneous. <laughs> so, so, so I'm trying to say that we have to become sensitive. What I find is, is that we need a wave of a new sort of knowledge, a new sort of approach in humanity. We need human beings to wonder about their inner dimensions and then wonder how important it is to share it. We have to begin acknowledging a, multi, a, a more evolved and adapted multidimensional reality. Let me tell you what's occurring in history right now. Darwin found out about evolution, but I'm pretty sure Darwin was like, okay, I'll, like I can't say this all. <laughs> like what, what Darwin couldn't tell people because the idea of evolution didn't exist yet was that this evolution has brought us to a free will. We can choose to hold the pen in our hand. We can choose to turn on the microphone. We can, we can choose 
Therefore, evolution now has to do with the creative ability of the creature. Before, it was with the creative ability of the world, as if before you were a phenomena that the world was moving. Now you have attained a sort of conscious specialness, this sort of separation. And most people feel lonely. They're like, man, <laughs> we see a lot of in modern Western society an incredible wave of depression. Okay, because it eventually nihilistic thought ends there. <clears throat> so, what happens is that this, the inefficiency in the states of mind of creatures on this planet has to do with one thing alone. Their direct awareness of what is. Any person who just, it's, it's an instant, there's no teaching, there's nothing. It's like looking in a mirror. It's like, like what kind of teaching you want? Just look in the mirror. <laughs> you know, it's as if like, like honestly, when I went to India, um, like uh, I went to India for two months in Rishikesh and I stayed in an ashram, in a nice, uh, you know, uh, ashram there. <clears throat> They had cobras in the ashram, but I was like, chill. I was like, okay. <laughs> you know? But um, what I'm trying to tell you... <laughs> what I'm trying to tell you is that... Um, when I was there, I noticed it's like all every person who's gone to get spiritual wisdom... Is like somebody who hasn't looked in a mirror yet and is asking people, what does my real face look like? Please, guru, please, enlightened person, tell me what my true, uh, you know, what, how, what my, like, in, like, point of my incarnation is. You know, New Age community is kind of indulging in this, like, in the same sort of desired manner as you can say, <clears throat> the ignorance of the corrupt Wall Street folk, you know? So it, it's like... <laughs> So what I'm trying to say is, is this is very crucial because sometimes we act good, but we don't recognize we have just avoided confronting our, our issues. It's like you cover yourself. It's Think of it this way. Um, when a person, imagine somebody's sitting <laughs> on a bench, okay, in the park. And now, let, okay, I'll, get, I'll make myself an example, okay. <laughs> Imagine I'm sitting in a park bench. Somebody comes up to me. Me and you are sitting on a park bench. Somebody comes up to me, to me specifically, as me and you are sitting there, and starts insulting and constantly shouting and saying, like, constant negative uh, stuff to me in front of both me and you. You know, he's doing this. Okay? Now... T let's say the average man would be like, who the fuck are you? Like, you'd f he'd fight back and, like, you know, kind of engage the intensity, right? I, I would ask myself in that moment, kind of like, how, what is the threshold of tolerance of not having to do anything about the situation yet? And uh, I'm telling you, when a person gets offended, it's because somebody has managed to move the thought of them to them. That means right now you're holding yourself in a certain light. You're, you're, you're considering yourself a certain person. When this personhood that is self-conceived is in some sense pushed by other forces, it will, you will eventually feel like you have to be, remain the same person or you have to adapt to the change. That means a system of order confronted by chaos might, must adapt to the change, kind of put a mirror in front of the chaos. That means uh, adjust to the same intensity or in some sense ignore. What that means is so many issues can be ignored if you just walk out of the situation. And this is also important conceptually because I consider beliefs and ideology and language to be a sort of, you can say, an architecture, uh, um, architectural structure. Like I'm telling you, it's an architected uh, kind of, like <laughs> it's like a designed structure. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Your sense of self is too designed to be a natural sense of self. This is why any ideal of perfection is a sort of echo fading in the void in the void space. Kind of Salvador Dali, the surreal painter, is an incredible man with an incredible kind of, he, he drew something on, on a canvas that I feel like no person ever thought was possible. And um, at that time, especially. And so Salvador Dali has this quote where he says, do not fear perfection. 
you will never reach it. And that sentence was so profound for me. Not just because I also draw, <laughs> but it was profound for me because I began to kind of see that my life is being sabotaged by my th thoughts of the, f the thoughts of the future that are occupying the present moment are denying me from the thoughts of the present moment. That is the issue with belief. This is why language is like a, is like a weapon, is like a sword. Okay, you can you you have to all, you. It's like it's 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 a double-edged sword. Believe it or not, it's as if like you can use it. Language language can be used to hurt others. It can be used to hurt yourself. It can be used to kind of blind blinding people. It's so easy. That's what to be honest. That's what magic was. Magic was trapping the person's conceptual kind of. Um, position in a, it's like it's like it's like putting the person's mind in a box of belief because they are too afraid to confront the truth. <clears throat> Sometimes life will throw suffering at you, and this suffering is going to be one of those things where. It's as if you acknowledge suffering and you see there's kind of like dimensions to it. There's an external suffering, like somebody in pain, very obvious what is occurring there. Then there's an internal suffering where that image of pain comes and goes throughout the person's life, disturbing their attention. And it's not that it's disturbing their attention. It's kind of like, you know, a sword is a sword and you got to wield it. You hold it by the handle and practice movement and motion and awareness of your space pretty much. You know, so for example, fighting our ancestors who fought with swords, a lot of them, you know, there's 100% viewers right now whose ancestors held swords, you know. <laughs> and so it's very fascinating. When I look at what's occurred in history, I got shocked. I got shocked when I looked at history. I got first shocked because it is so vast and there's so many lost technologies and lost uh, content that in some sense we can't put this puzzle piece back together. What that means is we have to change the approach. And so history has to transcend his story. Reality is one of those things where it's as if it's too designed. That means as if like if this world had a programmer, the programmer designed the periodic table in some sense, designed the various ways, the very, it, it, certain ways this world is working. Now for me, what was fascinating is that it's as if like the free will seems to appear in an environment where it suddenly wonders it is not the source of itself. That's the difference between... Uh, to be honest, there's no difference. It's like just like you can say all the belief wars, all wars start, all wars started from language. It's just sophisticated mouth noises, you know. It has to do more with how the mind is standing rather than just how your body behaves, whether it is savage or kind. It's very easy to be pulled into an animal, into an animalistic. By the way, guys, this is going to be a long talk, um, so uh, 
buckle in or, you know, <laughs> uh, do what you feel you should. Um, <clears throat> let's see. I'm trying to think. I'm trying to think of a playful kind of scenario or a thought experiment, a kind of example to share to kind of get this point across. Imagine right now, like Mr. Within, like in a <laughs> Imagine I'm like walking in a park right now, okay? Just me alone walking in a park. Um, now imagine I'm as I'm walking in a park, suddenly I see and imagine, this is all a hypothetical, okay? Imagine an extraterrestrial kind of presence appears, okay? They'll say an ex. okay, let's get embody it. Let's give it, uh, give it a body, like... Um, so in some sense, let's say a, an extraterrestrial comes there and comes and says, yo, Mr. Within, <laughs> the extraterrestrial's like, yo, Mr. Within, I've been hearing your podcast, man, you know, <laughs> I'll be like, oh my God, this extraterrestrial <laughs> is culturally acquainted, you know, <laughs> and then the extraterrestrial, imagine, imagine the extraterrestrial kind of comes and I'm there in the park and the extraterrestrial asks me, what's going on here, man? What's happening on this planet? What's the, what's your history like? tell me the backstory of humanity and so the way I would tell you the backstory <laughs> of humanity is is I guess like something like this okay first of all I acknowledge my limits I acknowledge that what I'm saying is more like kind of spear thrown at an unknown sky rather than a kind of document to share <clears throat> for me I guess I will say it like this <sighs> just a second let me change this sound <laughs> Humanity, let us say, evolved. <clears throat> what that means is nature, by its program and design, in some sense, extended from the dirt a sort of creature with a unique behavior to it. You can say, just like how you plant a seed, uh, in the soil and it becomes a tree after many years we in some sense saw humanity kind of be an extension of the earth that became conscious of itself that means first the creature's legs extended when you look at trees i consider all existential phenomena to be one moment <laughs> because i consider that many of the branches of knowledge that i perceive have the same trunk and um what I'm trying to say is that a sort of design that was being moved by nature, by the unconscious, let's say, suddenly, eventually began to acknowledge itself. So first the creature evolved, was like, oh my God, I'm separate from this world. I can run on this world. I can move. I can hunt. I can do all this stuff. So there was this kind of many years of an awareness to just body separate from world. This is before even the creature, this evolutionary kind of, let's say, ambition of an ape or a chimpanzee was like <laughs> this ambition eventually after many years of continuity as if the program repeated to such a point where the cup was full to the brim <coughs> the evolutionary program okay now After the cup was full to the brim, there was a surplus of attention. Attention had matured to a point where suddenly this creature looked in, the, in a pond or some like clear ice or something and saw its own face. When it saw its own face, it was as if two mirrors kind of held in front and a, and a light infinitely bouncing between the two, reflecting off the two, some, something like an infinite loop of light. 
okay? And uh, what occurred is that this creature began considering itself, and how can I say it? It's like the separation was that. There, there was an instantaneity, as if objective evolution, objective evolution, then suddenly something occurred, objective and subjective evolution. Suddenly a subjective context began occurring. The memory began to take shape. The memory of man opened up as if suddenly we all had these incredible, like endless file cabinets. And as life occurred, this file cabinet could be studied somehow by a sort of free will in the, name, in the making. So we see this evolutionary movement uh, bringing forth, and this is something they don't teach in schools, and I don't understand why. It was kind of a mystery. I was listening to what all the teachers were saying. And I'm like, how come this is not being acknowledged? It's as if I understand if the our, our idea of soul is kind of like, you know, unknown for people. But the idea of the mind's edge, the mind's depths, uh, the depths of our intelligence and its potential and its ability to shift the personality through a, through, uh, through a remembrance of a new presence. The subjective evolution, it's kind of like how we, we evolved into the paradigm where the awareness of self uh, was a kind of movement between consciousness and matter. That means you don't understand philosophy. It took billions of years for philosophers to be able to say something. <laughs> and nowadays philosophy is not respected somebody tells you you're a philosopher you tells you they're a philosopher you're like you're looking for work buddy <laughs> but i'm telling you it's uh philosophers were the roars of the human mind as it stared into the mirror of ex existence it wondered about it, the subjective reflection of the identity how the person is being the person, how the moment is being the person, how the moment is being the mind of the intelligence of the being, how the free will is where everything else is. And so we see the world suddenly shift from the stories trapped, uh, chained around the neck of a particle moving in space into a field of awareness into a field of intelligence. This is something our species has to figure out because when it does, it will suddenly have an overflow. It's as if like, you know how we saw, in, like I remember I saw a cartoon which I think was made by Disney. <laughs> Probably not Disney, I don't know. But it was like this car cartoon of a religious kind of story of Moses and like in Egypt or something. The animators were kind of modern, I guess. But whatever, like for the, for the time. <clears throat> and I... Uh, <laughs> And so in it, where there's this moment where Moses suddenly brings food and uh, brings grain and water to the, to, the, uh, cap to the captives, to the slaves. And so what happens is very, very intense. That scene was kind of like suddenly I realized in this program, like think about it, guys. Nature is this program, like as if some programmer wrote the code already. But suddenly in one part of the code, there is a glitch. The code has become aware of itself that it's code. So what occurs then? And that is where the realms of the mind will transcend the language threshold. I'm just watching the world, kind of how it's going to react to this. You know, how language is, uh, is, is kept uh, afloat, kept, is hovering on a rock in the middle of nowhere. Like, I don't know how to tell you this. <laughs> Science already has, but, it's, but the intensity of what it implies. So what that means is our free will must be used. It's a tool. It's as if, why is the tool there? Why does the person have imagination? That means there's something there to be used, as if like there's a tool, but you don't know what the tool is for. And this, is, this goes back to the ancient idea of self-development, <laughs> where like these mystics were on another level. They weren't on the level of like, you know, law of attraction, affirmation. You know, let me just repeat the same thing endlessly like a machine, and maybe life will happen like a machine. You know, and I will tell you that is sad. 
It is very sad when a human being doesn't realize they're human. <clears throat> How does this creative kind of evolutionary spark of a kind of named subjectively held entity, like, you, like right now as I'm speaking to you, like, do we not as a civilization acknowledge these depths and dimensions to reality? It's as if, like, imagine right now this whole world that we're seeing is just one room in a mansion. It just, I'm just being playful here, animating it. But I'm telling you, imagine what we see is not what is actually here. This suddenly means, uh, in some sense, uh, illusions are not just found in deserts. Mirages are not found in deserts. There is subjective mirages. There is what the person wants from life, shaping life more than how life actually is. That was the issue of the ego. That was the whole point of like Zen and Buddhist tradition being like, stay away from your you know desires. Don't get attached to your desires, bro. You know that was like a, like Zen mindset. You know, but for me that is uh, sure you can try. Okay, guys, uh, I'm back. Sorry about that.
from the singular first imagine i fully i will i will tell that extraterrestrial in the park based on that kind of situation hypothetical situation i was telling you i would tell it zero one two and then the alien would be like what do you mean by that zero one two and i'd be like it started from zero we knew nothing it was just un unknown then one suddenly there became one thing known a particle and a thought an object an objective phenomena and a subjective phenomena do you see so zero turned into one one turned into two and then from two into the evolution of the number three becomes the infinite landscape so after three the number three existence is inconceivable so what <laughs> No, no, what I mean by that, what I mean by that is that um, we, we cannot see, like we can see from the edges of duality into higher dimensions, but we cannot be, we cannot experience existence. We can't even retain consciousness. I consider at least, you know. So what do we do with an intelligence that in every moment can <clears throat> regenerate and realign ideology, meaning, and all phenomena? Fundamentally, I mean, like, just pretty much you can just be playful. So what that means is certain things in this life you must let go. And the things that have remained so far, you just appreciate. You appreciate, then you let go. You appreciate, then you let go. And eventually you will see in that appreciation comes the wonder of lifetimes. An infusion of both sides of your spectrum of reality which is kept dual. What that means is for how long would, is there going to be good people and bad people and good people and bad people. And eventually we're going to see it's just all we're all creatures on a planet. The, the identifications, the discriminations, they're all hallucinations. Racism is a hallucination. The person is, that person who's being racist is, is too caught in their thought. You know, it's as if their beliefs have held a gun at them. And because the, their beliefs have held a gun at them, they are holding a gun against the changing world. They're like, no, all this change should be seen only in this one thought structure, in this one conceptual domain. Trust me, there's a war of language going on. We're all casually just chilling, acting as if we are the names we speak of. You are not your name. Because if you are your name and you are an extension of the world, then the world is being a name. And we're calling that free will. There's many ways that life can be seen. I believe Edison has this quote where he says, um, I don't see it as failure. I've just found 10,000 ways that something doesn't work. <laughs> you know? And so that's, that's what I'm saying. I'm saying this world is kept through many eyes. Many people are seeing versions of the world in their eyes right now. If they cannot acknowledge the version 1.0 of their reality, they cannot go further into version 2.0. Now, someone may ask, what is the point of this kind of evolutionary process? Is it just for us to be a phenomena and that's it? And I will tell you, because of the added dimension of consciousness, like if we were like, if we couldn't speak as animals, it's as if like it wouldn't matter how far the inner realities wanted to communicate. You don't understand there has been a billion year solitude process. You have just been an, a speck of attention in a light beam.
the world moves in so many unknown ways, guys, just even throughout the day, that if you choose to contain it in a certain way, how can I tell you? It's as if it's like trying to, you know, get the whole waterfall into like a small cup, you know? <laughs> It's as if that guy who wanted to stop the waterfall by putting a cup underneath it. <laughs> Free will brings with it uh, the dimension of responsibility. The dimension of responsibility has to do with pretty much how how the intelligence is being and functioning in the environment. Once you study yourself, a, a, a way of looking at life will open up to you where you will see you are not just kind of defined by chaotic phenomena and you're not just defined by ordered phenomena. That means it doesn't matter how happy or sad you have memories of yourself. It doesn't matter. You, you are not defined by the, you are, you are the witness of the changing world. That means be, first be a watcher of your intelligence. What, ha, what does a kid do in school? Like pretty much watches the teacher, right? So similarly, Mr. Within is saying, watch yourself. Imagine now you are your teacher. You are the greatest mirror you can find. Because only you have your eyes. Nobody else has your eyes, you know? This is why uh, sometimes I find myself incredibly comfortable talking about this stuff. Because it is, it is how can I tell you? The world has many colors, as much as it has many eyes to see those colors. <clears throat> what I feel is going to become exciting is that for now, a lot of rhythm and kind of, let's say, man is bonding with his environment through sports, okay? Or like you can say deep sorts of meditation or whatnot. Like man is bonding with his environment. Now, as he bonds with his environment, the athlete finds himself in certain rhythms where he's trusting the energetic expression of the moment to even handle it. Okay? So sim similarly, I, I want to suggest that there's going to be collective rhythms. The species is going to suddenly move like birds in a sky all rhythmically flying or fish underneath the water swimming together. You know, so it's, it's as if a collective intelligence is kind of being kept. A collective rhythm is being found by the individual drop in the river of the moment, you know, something like that. It is not only important to be aware of how the world turns, but also how you turn the world. And when you become aware that you're turning the world, there occurs a sort of honest, hollow perception of the moment. That means you suddenly realize you can no longer lie to yourself, you know? And that is the nature of truth. It is a sort of redemption of not knowing. It's a confrontation where there is a self-transformation. That means something continues, the self is still the self, but it, has, it is navigating through a different form. You know, <clears throat> the Greek philosopher Heraclitus, he has this saying where he says, <coughs> He says no man can step in this, uh, this Greek philosopher says no man can step in the same river twice and it is not the same man and it is not the same river. 
This is an incredible sentence for the time where when the sentence kind of sprouted into manifestation, like when when I, I'm I'm impressed by Heraclitus's approach, and uh, that sentence is a sort of telescope for the modern world to recognize a sort of relationship in life where not only the cells of your body are changing every two weeks but your thoughts and beliefs and various views on life are changing as if you don't have the same eyes as you did when you were 10 years old for example you know so when your eyes are not the same It's like one brain, two hemispheres. It's like one moment and two dimensions, the subjective and the objective. Seldom this is said, the mother of infinity is duality. And the grandmother of duality is the one. Like, not like the matrix, the one. Like, just is the number one. <laughs> and, you know, it's as if that question, who do the gods pray to? And you see, they pray to no one. They are the pure cause of the moment. They are not burdened by the effects of a changing world. They look at the changing world and just, in some sense, they watch the suffering and they see how it moves. That means on some, some manner, I believe there are certain mystics that uh, they saw a personality to the planetary intelligence, to the planet. It wasn't just the ancient Greeks that uh, in some sense saw Gaia, saw the planet as a sort of kind of uh, feminine divine expression, you know. The mother of man is the world, Gaia. And prior to Gaia, there is Kronos, chaos. That means I find it an incredible achievement to even be alive. <laughs> People are like, what have you achieved? You know, I'm like, I'm alive. <laughs> Do you know how long that took? <laughs> it took like billions of years for me to be who I am right now. And people go around uh, like in society having depression and stress. Do you know how ancient your genetical existence is? Some people say the DNA is the book of life. And when people wonder about who was the writer, you know, of this book, they find uh, the same eyes as their ancestors, kind of similar stare as their ancestors on their own face. There have been moments where I have seen that you have to you kind of divide.
to continue. Pretty much the species, based on its natural design, has to endlessly attempt doing things in this life. And because now there has developed a sort of dimension of consciousness and a dimension of matter, what I mean by that is as there is a sort of objective life being lived and a sort of subjective life, uh, sorry, a subjective and objective life being lived, so it's, it's as if we have to kind of choose how far the objective life wants to continue in the biological kind of a practice, like the biological vehicle, and how much the kind of, how can I tell you, the subjective life of the individual to kind of occur. For me, it's kind of very chaotic, guys, because it's as if biology has been this sort of kind of push, this sort of inspiration to generate a subjective existence. Now this subjective existence, it's burst. It's kind of like your waking life is a unique expression of your energetic being, let's say. As the moment arrives where human beings have to decide how much of their biological existence they want to sacrifice, how much objective reality should be sacrificed for subjectivity. So just entertain this notion of the subjective life and the objective life of the person. Now, the objective life, it is kept by nature's biology, the bio biological aspect. Now, this biological aspect, how far, how long do we want to choose for this body to just be organic? What if suddenly the person wants to use technology to update their strength? So, like, instead of going to the gym, they get a robot arm. Eventually, they realize they constantly change their, because they want to, the ego wants to be uh, great. Because the ego wants to be great, it is trying to become strong endlessly. Because it's trying to become strong endlessly, the ego is, tends to exist because there's a sort of orientation to the future. Your mind is generate is, is, is a generation. I don't know how to tell you. But anyways, like... The ego is trying to be great. In that attempt to be great, uh, again, there's this gullible notion uh, of endlessly continuing the process. So the person, pretty much the guy who wants to be the strongest person in the world, will eventually become a machine. Literally, his whole body will become a machine. So pretty much then that becomes, that brings forth the next reign of, like next era of kind of philosophers into being because now they have to contemplate the sac again, the sacrifice of the bio biological kind of uh, body for a sort of mechanical body, which then may give, give how can I say it, uh, like your mind is connected to a cloud or something, as sci-fi suggests. So what I'm trying to tell you that
we're going to either be we are either going to be humans that act like machines or machines that act like humans this is the situation we're going to seek evolution's edge uh, not edge evolution's peak and as we reach the peak of our biological evolution we will have to make a decision of how far we want the mind to just experience a biological body so it brings a very unique kind of uh, domain of philosophy to again engage for the new philosophers but but anyways so this notion of the objective life and the subjective life to be conscious of it uh, really puts you ahead it, it, it's like that's the supreme gift of the human intelligence to be able to acknowledge a sort of even before I say multidimensionality a dimension a dimensionality a sort of containment of the objective realm through language or image or, or whatever abstract content arrives so for me this is my discussion like I, I, I all often ponder with myself sometimes when I uh, it's like I learned something from chess that was kinda like a blessing in chess this is something that no many ego driven chess masters won't tell you <laughs> I don't know why people didn't tell me this. I found it online, right? And it's this notion that, of course, like if you have a worthy opponent, you play chess with them. It's incredible. Like it's like a war of minds. And so, that chess game, um, I want to say it. <laughs> the thing I learned was to play chess with myself as the online kind of entry article was suggesting and I was like what how, how is it possible to play chess with yourself you know all the moves like how is it gonna be exciting and then I realized something that the person in the article said what you what you do is like imagine you get a chess board okay and um, let's say you put this chess board plastic chess board on like a glass table okay so when you put this chess plastic very like lightweight chess board on this glass table so what you do is um, you make one move as the white piece then you turn it around and just you wait like eight seconds like you you just wait a couple seconds like the longer you wait it's like the, the suddenly you begin to see it's as if when you act when you honestly play it's like you're you're challenging your greatest moves on both sides that's what I'm trying to tell you okay so what that means is like that this this um, idea of playing chess with yourself <laughs> playing chess with yourself what it means is to seeing to play, getting used to playing the offensive side and the defensive side and you are challenging yourself so you try to actually forget that you put, you were the black pieces and look at the white pieces and make a move and then you turn around the chessboard and you th you forget you were white pieces you think you're the black pieces you're like okay I gotta win as the black pieces so what's the, my greatest move and your greatest uh, um, uh, movements in chess are being challenged it's as if you're playing against your greatest moves you know something like that so that similar notion can also be used in self-inquiry. <laughs> Ta-da! That's the kind of, you know, the glow of the enlightening conversation. So this notion of kind of being able to see through both sides means you have to be able to function properly in your subjective life and your objective life, and you got to see the extent of your free will. And again, that appreciate let go mentality. Okay, so what that means is that you got to first see your objective life, it has limits. Okay, based on the subjective significance of time, we say that, okay, you're, let's say every person can live 100 years. Let's just, you know, be cheerful. <laughs> and so, in this 100 years, that the person, you see the destiny and the inevitability of the destination of the objective component of your moment of being. So you see your body. Okay, now this is the objective life. Now you choose how healthy you want to be. You choose what you walk towards pretty much. Okay.
many people don't consider it, but religion was an incredible global evolution of the imagination. You don't understand how important it was for people to suddenly have stories in their life that was that was suggested there was more to life than just them. That was the notion of God. That's why the idea of God exists. We call it God. We, we see the surface kind of effect of God. And eventually modern society separated it. We're like, okay, religion, kind of stay in your own room and we're going to be here. But that's like the temporary solution. Okay, because eventually people are going to wonder. And so if the secular society doesn't have a very profound narrative that makes the person kind of wonder about life and see a meaning to it, if it doesn't provide that, eventually the secular society will kind of wreak havoc. That means they will be pulled towards a nihilistic hedonism, a sort of we're only here once kind of fuck it, let's do whatever. Like kind of anarchy and that's very imp important I mean that that's creative <laughs> it's as if like a, a director will look at an angry person and he's like that's some good angry acting even though the person's actually being angry <laughs> I believe it was uh, Stanley Kubrick who in his um, in the movie The Shining Jack Nicholson literally had to that scene where he's throwing the ball on the wall had to do it 150 times and eventually Stanley Kubrick chose the second shot you know <laughs> second take so <laughs> so it was one of those things where Stanley Kubrick was kind of putting the actor in a sort of obstacle course of training to see the intensity of the anger that could emerge for example or the acting that could emerge because the realm of film, uh, it, it has a shadow and it also has a bright side. And the bright side of film is the dissemination of efficient kind of vision. So what works, we want to share it with everybody instantly. It's like, don't delay. You know, It's as if the worst thing a person who wants to help somebody to do is to wonder, okay, how, should I help them now when it's like, you got to put yourself aside and run towards the dying world and preserve it. You have to live for life. That means people have this mentality now, live for life. I want to live for life. I want to be eternal, immortal. I want to go, you know, kind of, you know, sleep on a cloud in heaven for the rest of my life, you know, <laughs> you know, or the rest of my afterlife, you know, and uh, it becomes one of those things where <clears throat> I can say that there are many people on this planet where ideas are their masters. That means objective slavery, there is an incredible, I was fascinated how quickly our species realized uh, the tragedy that was the savageness of man's mind. It's as if when there's a better solution and you take the wrong, you don't take that better solution, it's as if you, a fool is born when an opportunity is not seen. <laughs> I think that's the most poetic sentence ever said about a fool. <laughs> I have seen um, many uh, fascinating human beings on this planet, both in history books and alive. And when I've seen these people, what I've noticed is what fascinates me the most is how it's as if, think of it this way, we're all on a battlefield, there's a war going on. That's as if we're all, all humanity is like this village. Okay, and there's, there's a siege occurring. It's as if all humanity is one kingdom, you know, the kingdom of humanity. And then it's being sieged. It's being sieged by the forces of nature and the unknown savageness of the programs of the, that lie dormant in the DNA and cause the man, a man to suddenly devolve into an animal, but to realize he can rise in an instant. There, there are many ways the world is kept, but how far shall our eyes open? How deeply shall we care about the world? And where will it lead? 
You know, it's one of those things where it has to do with your approach, trust me, because it's as if somebody went to the scientist and he's like, buddy, if you're cutting up the particle, seeing some other particle there, what if there's endlessly subtler dimensions, as if there isn't just the atom, there isn't just the electron, proton, neutron dimension, there isn't just the quarks dimension, there isn't just even we go lesser, let's say the 11 you know, this is, of course, a theory, but like the 11 vibrating strings of, you know, vibrating dimensions, string-like dimensions of string theory, like whatever, whatever which way you can infinitely go. So as if the poet looked at the scientist and said, my dear human being, what are you occupying yourself with? And where is it leading? And if you have good answers, continue it. Because that's the whole point. How long can we live for individuals? How long can people just idolize and glorify their individualness to themselves before they die? For how long is this going to happen? When will the humility of the species arrive? When will we see that it is more unknown than known and so knowledge should not be strict in its ways? That civilization, if people's minds were flexible, could change overnight? And so, how has nature held our eyes open? How does the world move as us? These are these. This is where the species is one pondering. Like, <laughs> this is the direction we're looking at. And language, I am telling you, you cannot get proof by language. And scientists are starting to notice this. They're starting to notice why a person, why there's so many, like honestly I'll tell you, even though population is increasing, but the interest for science seems to be less. And that has to do with two issues because of how science is marketed to people, where people like Neil deGrasse Tyson are fixing. And it has to do also with the narrative, with the value of the data. And the value of the data is what updates your story. And a person who feels they cannot attain the, what it's as if like when the world doesn't listen to your mind, your mind tries to suddenly kind of smuggle in certain moments where it feels it is God. Do you see? An angry person, trust me, it's like they feel that what they see is the only thing. That is why they are, they are a blind animal. <laughs> I'm sorry, but that's what anger uh, this is that's what uh, unconscious anger, let's say, is is like anger that is like not in the conscious control of the being. That means an image has hijacked their mind, and so they're endlessly reacting to it behind their eyes. <laughs> you know, it's because we are trying to enforce our world upon the world. And when that stops comes the platform of innovation. Many renaissances will arise from just an atmosphere that is peaceful enough to work in. That's what I feel. That's how I feel civilization needs to be designed. We got to give space. We can't constantly design society so the person at the end of their life, they reach what they want. That's, that's like missing out on the whole journey. That's like you closing your eyes on the roller coaster and the last part of the roller coaster opening your eyes. Nice. After like 70 years of living, you succeeded. And then we ask the person why the decisions were made and we see the person had no choice. Their grandparents to their ancestors did the same thing and their ancestors did the same thing. And there was this endless kind of follow the program till the day you die kind of mentality. And so cows were taken to the slaughterhouse thinking that they are in some sense being led to their freedom. That is, that is the way the chaotic machine of society, and I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, like, guys, I, I don't mean this is like, this is, this is certain ways I have perceived society. So my, my content, you should listen to it, of course, playfully. You know, Aristotle says it is the sign of an educated mind to entertain an idea without accepting it. You know, but anyways, <laughs> I'm going to continue. It's, it's, it, so what can I say?
I guess guys this is going to be part one because my uh, actually hold on let me get a charger <laughs> Problem solved. All right, where were we? If the universe could give a command to living phenomena and specially conscious individualized phenomena, it, it's as if the universe will look at the free will of man and say, man, you have opened your eyes in an infinite playground, in, a, in, a, in the paradise, in a sort of paradise of endless forms and designs. Conscious design is a heavenly experience at its core. And so we are conscious of the design of the world everywhere. We cannot avoid the sensory data because it is being us. We cannot avoid the mind being the body's movement. Therefore, as we step out of fixed linguistic structures that we have lived in for our attention has just been on, it's as if the freedom of the attention is the most important thing. You have to free your attention from your beliefs. This doesn't mean you shouldn't believe things. It just means, like, don't put your head in a box and then hate the world because you don't see it right. That is the issue with, with greed's vengeance. A greedy man always, he can't avoid revenge. Do you see a greedy person is like, I've been hit, I will hit back, you know? <laughs> and so it's, uh, there's a lot of savage kind of program, like when you look at it from afar, a lot of violent behavior is just animalistic programs. It's as if like, you know, two people made two robots, and these robots are all both reacting to past moments. As if two people fighting on the street, they're not just fighting on the street. Each person in their mind is is kind of spiraling through all their memories and awareness and attention and just all how their intelligence is. This is why mastery was peace, because peace was actually the uh, the evolution of order uh, chaos how can I tell you it's as if the hardship that human beings went gave them gave them an ability to see how easy life can be and that's the task 
that's the task that we have to free our minds from their limitations in uh, through a wonder of the limitlessly un unknown. The sky has no edge, ladies and gentlemen. The sky has no edge. And so there's a quote I say, I say that uh, your body is made of earth, your mind is made of the sky. Your mind is here like a spacious attention, like an attention in space. Now this attention in space finds itself immediately uh, coordinated, oriented in the body. So right now I'm moving my hand in front of my eyes and this attention that is being space is aware of this hand moving. I'm even seeing the shadow of my hand, you know, on the wall. So, so what I'm trying to tell you right now is that um, this spacious attention is meaningless, neutral, suddenly values emerge. As these values emerge, this neutrality holds the power of the... Uh, collective unconscious and how it's a field of movement trust me when you follow your memories yeah uh, those people who think they have past lives i mean that's nice you know <laughs> good job but i'm telling you life is not just about past lives past lives is is just the tip of the iceberg you will eventually go to a reverse engineering of your pure attributeless attention out of, in some sense, any sort of conceptual structure. You free your eyes from the designs that you were fed as a child. Not as a child, but just how your it's like, it's not just your parents that fed you like baby food. <laughs> Civilization fed you ideology. And you had no choice because this is how far we've evolved. It is kind of what I consider to be a uh, extraterrestrial intelligence. It's not just an alien with a body. Like, what is that? Well, it's not just like a creature. That is, that is like, again, the tip of the iceberg. Well, what I see is that it is uh, something unique. It's a rhythm of how intelligence suddenly is animated. So we don't realize the, the incredible uh, ability we as human beings have in comparison to all the other species. We have opened our eyes in, uh, through the technologies of you know, language and speech into kind of an ability to recreate the world in any way we want. It's not like just the caveman kind of hit sticks in a rock or something like together and suddenly there was fire. The caveman took phenomena from its environment and smashed it together. And so Albert Einstein's definition of genius is when two worlds that are separate suddenly come into one. Suddenly two different tools are used at the same time to create one phenomena. You know? So that's the thing, that it's not just like our, at the caveman, we're looking for sticks and stones, we are looking for ideas and views and beliefs and philosophies and da 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 da. The caveman was looking around in a sort of objective landscape only. We are now looking in an objective but also subjective landscape. And the subjective landscape also has to do with your ability to see it. That means truth is like a phoenix flying in the sky and you got to just see it. You know, you got to see it in the sky. It's not, it's not something that the person has to, it's like it, the phoenix will not stop for you. How life, life, time moves forward. Time is an opponent I have in some sense been kind of combat, combating skillfully and playfully. Like in, I've been in a kind of sword combat with, you know, I've been fighting with. I've been fighting with time. There's been moments where time is too short, you know, it's like there isn't enough time. There's been moments where, you know, there's so much time, what to do. And then there's moments in my mind every day has been generating various forms of time. And I'm like, for how long? For how long am I, am I going to ignore the presence of my direct experience and kind of just cower away in, in beliefs? 
language, you are not, you are not a thought. Technology is kind of, it's a technology. Individual conscious, it's like the story of the free will is a technology. <laughs> Language pretty much is a world in a world. And consciousness is the spotlight on the stage. And the world performs. Every day becomes a performance for an eternal witness. A temporary performance for an eternal witness. The silence and stillness of the eons find you. A sort of breeze of clarity hits you. You suddenly look at life and you realize what it means to you. Not the you that the world wants you to be. Not the you that you've been sold on to be is the coolest you. But the real you. The being that's actually here. The presence. The pure presence of this Trust me, language is something we incorporate into our consciousness. The cha I have con I have memories before learning language. I was just a moment of sight. It's as if it's as if like there there is memory. There, I don't want to say memory is linear. That's very too bold of a statement to say that people remember things in an ordered fashion. It's not like that. We're not computers. We it's kind of like how we how we hold ourselves suggests the data we have access to well our actions suggest uh, the state of being because the activity changes the state of being it's like the person it doesn't matter what kind of mushrooms they order on their pizza either way the state of mind is changing chemically So uh, the nature of the self of selves is, I guess, from a Vedic context, it is the individual, it's the Atman, it's the individual consciousness of the being, which is the mind. The Atman is the mind. The soul is Parabrahman. It is, it is like the fall, it's like the source of the source of the source. Okay? Eventually, the source of the source of the source is uh, unfathomable, incomprehensible. We find this in religions, by the way. And if, especially Vedic culture, it was as if suddenly Krish, uh, Arjuna, Arjuna in the Bhagavad Gita asked Krishna, I want to see your true form, God. And God shows Krishna and it's like so intense, so bewildered, overwhelming that he cannot fathom. It's as if it's like he saw something beyond his eyes. Stories are important because um, the thoughts of ourself are alive in stories. The stories we tell ourselves will direct and dictate the attention. So I want you to free yourself, not free yourself, <laughs> like free yourself through a recognition that the free will is a new moment of attention. That in a moment of being, there is nothing that needs to define it. It's like a combination of the ripples on a pond with the Patanjali Yoga notion of consciousness being a sort of orb, glass orb moving around, uh, over colored surfaces. And so its connection to the ripples of a pond, it's as if suddenly when the mind is, uh, the ripples of the pond settle, when there is that sort of graceful awareness of awareness, you know. <laughs> You know, it's as if you realize the presence of your consciousness beyond the personality. So the contents of your consciousness do, do not can, can do not no longer define your awareness. So you have, in some sense, navigated beyond the language threshold, beyond the clouds of belief and dogma. The pilot of consciousness navigates uh, as the whole plane of existence. You suddenly become the world you're living for because you have always been it. You suddenly realize it doesn't matter what people's minds generate. They generate different things all the time. There's so many thoughts that 
thoughts die much quicker than bi uh, biological bodies. So in one, bo like in one lifetime, various angles of perception and ways that attention is going to move. And the way that attention moves is the kind of a suggestion of the formulation of the thought. Okay, and so we even find not only in Vedic culture and in ancient Indian culture, but even in shamanic Native American culture as well. We suddenly see the wisdom of the shaman of the existential life sensitivity to uh, how the mind is being the body and how the body is being the mind. Suddenly, in, let's say, let's create a kind of playful ancient Greek scenario. I don't think this happened, but I'm just saying let's say. Um, suddenly, somebody finds the spirit of Gaia, the spirit of the planet. And let's say, let's say it's this girl, okay? She finds the spirit of the planet, and she looks at the great mother soul, the oversoul of all being, you know, and looks at Gaia. Not the oversoul, but like, you know what I mean? <laughs> like Gaia, you know, the, and looks at the spirit of the planet, and this girl says, Gaia, I have one question. And Gaia says, speak, my daughter, you know. And the girl looks at this kind of god and says to her, goddess, and says to her, to the spirit of Gaia, to the spirit of the planet, Sorry guys, sometimes when I give these talks, um, the thoughts move faster than me. And I just watch at that point, so suddenly I'm silent in the talk. But, um, reality is fascinating. I feel we should all have the subjective outlook of an explorer. We should care for life, and people are like, what's the point of life we're like, we're to figure out? to figure out what it is, to live the journey, to at least live it. You know, it took us billions of years for the science project called Humanity to be here, okay? And we must contribute to it. That should be the purpose of the educational system, to involve all children in the greatest science project of them all the human existence, the human civilization, the advancement, the structuring of it. There should be global communities. Like right now, we're separated in nations, still in too inefficient. Okay, we are still, that's one country, that's another country. How, 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 play, how, you know, fascinating, you know, leaders of nations are playing costume games. They're, they're, they are in some sense playing a, the, no, the idea and the notion of like, you know how ch like children act out like a play or something like when child young children play with one another they act like one of children embodies certain uh, avatar of a hero or something you know it's like that it's self idolization it's as if the minds of men still want to own land i mean of course we can't i can't expect like there's no way i'm challenging the real estate industry but i'm just saying <laughs>
<laughs> I'm just saying. I'm just saying. It's like uh, I'm thinking ten thousand, like thousands of years ahead, and I'm wondering how we are going to behave as entities. And uh, my mind at first thinks it's inconceivable, and I agree with it. But then I wonder what if, and those what ifs become these talks and so on. As you study how your attention moves, you study how you have accepted language to be uh, associated to meaning. Imagine like there's a bottle here, and um, there's a bottle right now in my hand, and this bottle, uh, let's say it's just an object, we haven't, the word bottle hasn't even been created yet, and so we're looking at this object, suddenly somebody says, let's call it a bottle. Now imagine somebody, instead of telling someone for the first time, you see, they see this bottle and you say, hey man, this is not a bottle, this is a phone. And the person ascribes the word phone to this object, as if they've never heard the word bottle before. And so when they're suddenly with somebody else and they're like, yo, that's a phone. And that person <laughs> like, no, no, that's a bottle, you see. And so then it becomes a challenge of what word, what shape, what design is being imposed on the objective phenomena. What's incredibly powerful to comprehend is that everything that has physically occurred has, has nothing to do with how the thoughts were. That means it doesn't matter how the thoughts were. It's like whether we like anarchy or not, our, our thoughts, are they come and go. Thanks for tuning in, guys. Sometimes I don't know if I talk too much or not. I feel I do. <laughs> but the vision's strong. It's as if, like, I, I, I kind of think about the value of my life, and I wonder if uh, we're going to wake up to a sort of global humanity. We're going to wake up to a humanity that doesn't per se have to have these nations all uniting. We just have to say, let's assume. Let's try to simulate the world, see what the simulation of all, all countries being one world, be, being kind of one world uh, is going to be like. So what I feel is that like these, the thing is I realize we can't change the past. It's too heavy. It's too heavy weight of a burden. You can't change the past. So if you can't change the past, how does civilization evolve, you know? So let me tell you how it evolves. You keep the past. You're like, okay, past, you stay here. All those people want to repeat what their ancestors did. Okay, great, good for you. Keep doing it. You know, but at the same time, as you're repeating the past cycle, okay, as you're doing what your ancestors did, you give certain amount of a tiny percentage of your time to wonder, to just wonder about the global world, uh, the, the uh, global community, and how the sort of kind of presence we presence of uh, intelligent conversation we find in in online, we can see it in the world. <clears throat> Oscar Wilde has this awesome quote where he says, "Give a person a mask, and he'll tell you the truth." <laughs> and um. I'm not suggesting a theme from a V for Vendetta like movie, you know. <laughs> but we have to wonder about our true nature. We have to wonder about its objective consequence and its subjective consequence and the brilliance of how the design occurs. On some level, nothing has to mean anything, it's just all design that's here present as attention is you know but then there's also various ways that it can be it can be and so the world is open and so knowledge becomes inspired by the unknown let me tell you who the teacher of all your teachers are it is the unknown those who comprehend this you are not wise you are you are just you know regular <laughs> you've just like you are you, it's like you're in it's like the wisdom of the old world is the kind of uh just the uncommon wisdom of the ancient world becomes common. It becomes the, um, I don't want to say norm, but <sighs> you don't become a servant of your mind. There's this ancient saying that say the mind is a, a lousy master, but a great servant. And so your mind, if you acknowledge it as a sort of technology, 
So you want to first study this technology. You want to see, okay, what is it like? What is this? How does my attention move? How does it? This is so important, guys, to realize because this is what our ancestors had before technology and civ and civilization's luxury replaced that dimension of intensity in our lives. We have come far, but we can never say we have come far enough. And that is why I feel in, in my lifetime, I would like to just say it at least, that the species, the civilization should attempt, we should attempt the, the, the most efficient vision of the civilization. We should at least see what it would be like. To be free with the wonders of a new system. We have to simulate. We don't change the past. We ask the past to create a new dimension, a new tolerance, you know? So it's as if like one-fifth uh, one of the human being's attention is going to how their civilization is evolving. It's as if the person, the father doesn't come home just to check to see how his, son, uh, how his son's day was at school. The father comes and checks and sees how the state of the civilization, how the efficiency of the world is kind of growing up. Henry David Thoreau, I consider him to be an enlightened American poet, he says, it's not what you're looking at that matters, it's what you see. And similar to scientific evidence, you suddenly you're like, whoa, it's not what I'm looking at that matters, it's what I see and what you see is how you put it into a mold of a story. How, to, how, you, how you trap the world in ideas. And of course, I don't want to say it in a... <laughs> uh, like, you guys have to understand, like, even though I consider the audience, this is my poetic stage, you know, I, <laughs> yeah, anyways. Sri Ramana Maharshi tells us, meditation is your true nature. Zen Master Dogen says the path of the enlightened one, the path of Buddha, was to kind of study the self. As you study the self, you forget the self. As you forget the self, you awaken to the nature of all things. What that means is you see how you are a person, okay? Then you suddenly, the moment you have observed something, you are also observing beyond it, okay? So the moment you see yourself, you see new ways that you're seeing yourself, okay? So the new way you see yourself becomes a sort of forgetting of the self that you were. As you see yourself in a new way, suddenly it says to study the self is to forget the self. To forget the self is to awaken to the nature of all things. That means you suddenly recognize the attributeless presence of, of, of our awareness in the moment where something new is happening. And how the only thing that doesn't change is change. Therefore, if, if awareness exists, it is changeless. Because change is occurring within it. The dualistic mind can only go so far. Then its experience uh, takes the steering wheel. Value your experiences. I see some people go to temples, worship people. When I was in India, I saw that some people just go and they just kiss the statue. I mean, that's great. It's always good to kiss like a, a, a statue of the truth. But it's <laughs> like there's nothing wrong with that. But it is more important to realize why the statue is there in your sight and why sight is here and now and when you look at something that's now here it's very similar to the word nowhere just look at the word nowhere how it's how it's the letters of it a space in the middle and you're now here <laughs> from nowhere so language, science doesn't comprehend this, but its findings are reporting back to the language narrative of the civilization, which has an unknown aspect, has an unconscious mind. So you cannot, this is why Albert Einstein was so wise, so many people don't understand. Some people belittle his statement where he said, imagination is the sign of true intelligence. Why? Why did Albert Einstein say that? When all the science teachers are, are not promoting imagination, they're promoting you being able to record data. Like how many lives of students, how many ch children in the educational system 
you know, instead of uh, learning about how, instead of kind of their, their creativity to be uh, expanded on, in some sense they were just made into regurgitators, you know. And of course we can't say, I mean, it is always introduction of data, but I'm telling you, the creative ability of the individual transcends it because it's the same creative ability that is teaching it. So even the teacher wants the educational system to care about uh, the, the evolution of the perception of the student and how multidimensionally uh, alive and efficient it can be. Because this world, let me tell you, it's not you can put any sort of philosophy on it, you know, but what occurs is that people fight for what they see and if they only see what they see then they are fighting in a box as if it's a guy with a weapon with a sword in his hand running at you but there's a box on his head and you're like what the hell's going on so we w w civility commands gentleness the ancient greeks understood this the ancient greek philosophers have a saying where they say to tame to tame the savageness of man and make gentle the life of this world because they understood in gentleness the mind opens its wings it feels free enough to be to be to be, to be uh, it's as if that we, we it's like in the present moment we are we are running towards the fact future in such a fast space like imagine we're trying to get to the future at the speed of light and suddenly we see the future is here the moment is the moment It's, it's, it, it's, this life is um, uh, witnessing a great happening. That's pretty much it. Something incredible is happening. It's life. Life is happening, you know. And how many people are alive? There's this kind of saying that says something, man, most people just exist. Very few live. And we must wonder about this. Because the nature of the self of self remains and how the attention is present as the whole moment, not just an objective component or a subjective component. Be free before you need to be. Much blessings and namaste.